three cheers for Beyonce and everything that she does. But she still had a diamond sparkly thong on and had to do that. Even in this day and age, she cannot be a woman who at some point does not be in a diamond sparkly thong. And even she is victim of this. Her counterpart, Adele, who can go in a full length gown and just sit and there. isn't that wild? <laughs> Isn't that wild? There. We are still in an era where most women of color received their wealth from hypersexualization of themselves. Black excellence at its finest. How that skin glow, she's a true diamond. With the world at our back, she's still smiling. Never let that crown till she stays thriving. What up, what up, what up? Welcome to That's It, That's All, y'all. I'm your host, hey. Casey. Hey. Today, we got Maya on the Hi. show and the Dej. Hi. Um, and today, we're going to, um, this is actually a part three episode through Slap the Network um, on adultification bias through black children. Um, we felt it was necessary to keep the discussion going because clearly it's still super prevalent. It's still happening. And we want our kids to be kids and be able to develop in the way they should be developing and not put faster than they have to be Absolutely. so let's just jump right into it let's just say cheers y'all cheers salute, salute. 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 i can't reach you the judge but you know how that works i'm gonna be the bridge <laughs> be <you>. the bridge <laughs> so trouble waters honey <laughs> um before we jump into it for those who don't know what adultification is i would like to read you guys the definition so you guys are aware of what it is um adult adultification bias is a form of racial prejudice where children of minority groups typically black children are treated by adults as being more mature than they actually are mm-hmm. so let's just jump right into it let's hear some of your thoughts about adultification and has it actually directly affected you at any point of your life I think it's destroying it's destroying and it's killing our children, right? And it's destroying our like developmental stages as kids, right? Like we all go through de- developmental stages. When you make a child an adult before they're ready, you mess with their brain chemistry because they're not going through those developmental stages in an appropriate way. They're not getting to explore, they're not getting to develop their defenses, develop their thinking, develop their problem solving in a way that is specific to children. They're developing it in a way that is expected of them as an adult. So it impacts us for the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. And it also impacts if you don't have the tools to know how to navigate through these waters, then the expectation of you suddenly, because you're of a certain age, but at this age, you're a larger size than your non-black counterparts. So you therefore should automatically be given the key to how to navigate this right. is a lot to put on somebody who's 10. Well, what do you well, mean, yeah. and what do you mean ha- by larger sizes? Like as well, far as... We, Genetics are still genetics, okay? Mm. You brought black people here on boats, and only the strongest of us survived. We tend to be a little larger in size, a little larger in stature, Mm -hmm. right? And we tend to develop, Mm -hmm. you know, a little more rapidly because Mm -hmm. of this. Because you brought people here and... Only the strongest of them survive. So you made super people, pretty right. much, pretty and, much. You know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go down this rabbit hole. But systemically, also look at the food deserts. Mm-hmm. Look at what foods we're eating. Mm-hmm. Right. Look at the water quality. Look, look at what foods are available and right. what foods are encouraged. So we have significantly more oh, hormones yeah. in our bodies. So we absolutely, are- absolutely, I agree with that because, like, I was, I was telling a story about like I was living in China once, and um, the first month, like my intestines was fucked up like it was bad and I really thought it was something that I was eating there like yeah. I really honestly thought I was something eating there and I went to the doctor and I, as you know as you know the day progresses and what was happening it was just like my body was releasing all the um, all the hormones in American food all the preservatives in American food because over there they make everything fresh they wake up in the morning they're churning their spices they're going they're cutting fries like they do it every morning it was the reason why I told you 
because she I had done her the job mm-hmm. if you are a singer you've done in yes. any capacity <laughs> you've done this Shanghai yes. Beijing <laughs> China freaking job so and learning to survive it's kind of a weird situation because mm-hmm. the air quality alone Terrible. you're like what? People are blowing smoke in your throat as you're hitting the highest note you could possibly have. So and I'm... there's like an air quality like <laughs> index that you have to watch to be able to mm-hmm. go outside. It's real mm-hmm. deep. Mm-hmm. So the one thing that I told you, I was like, that's the reason why the tea is expensive. Go and get the price of your tea. Right. And you were like, you really? And I said, get the price of your tea. Did it work? It worked. She saved my life. She gave me this little pack of powder. Saved my life. But yeah, so but going back to <laughs> going back to the actual topic, when you're talking about developmental stage and you're talking about how we are bigger, you know, the over sexualization of oh, yeah. black children, especially b- black girls, mm-hmm. you know, going into like, you know, because they may look like a woman, they may have the features as a grown woman. Right. They're still 10 children. years old. They're still yeah. 11 years old. So and, and when you when you are developing as a sexual being, right, there's stages, right? That starts fairly early, right? So when you're when you when you are going up to a ten year old black girl and telling her, you know, you acting grown, you being fast, you're doing all these things, she's not she doesn't conceptually understand what you're saying. But what you're doing is you're introducing these things in and into her and you're space labeling it. before she even has the ability to get developmentally to a space where she can actually conceptually understand that. And the way that she's being approached in the world. And so instead of healthily developing her sexuality or healthily developing her tools to manage people around her sexuality, she's forced to already know. So then what's happening is is that she's creating what she thinks is the appropriate way of being Mm. and what she thinks is how you manage men or how you manage women or how you manage people. How she, she, she's developing, she's creating ways on how you, you manage spaces. And what we see is where she's getting that information, TV, what you're saying to her, how people are treating her. And she's not getting to develop that healthily in a safe space. And let's keep it a buck. We're still, in an era and this is not to downplay these women at all because i think that they are all fabulous but we are still in an era where most women of color received their wealth from hypersexualization of themselves mm-hmm. it's a and that's that mm-hmm. like i don't you know what i mean three cheers for Beyonce and everything that she does but she still had a diamond sparkly thong on well I and, mean, and had to do that but here's the thing with Beyonce I'm gonna take Beyonce out of that because Beyonce going in Destiny's Child those those were appropriate outfits she developed no but I I'm think, saying yeah. even in this day and age yeah we're talking about she society. cannot be a woman who at some point does not be in a diamond sparkly thong and even she is victim of this absolutely because you got you know her counterpart Adele, who can go in a full length gown, Zactamundo, and just sit and there. Isn't that wild? <laughs> isn't that wild? There. And and a full length, no butt, no, no booty, no titties, and all the Grammys and all the things. <laughs> and the thing but is, but Beyonce got to still shake it for dollars, mm-hmm. and you still that won't dollars. give her, <laughs> and you still won't give her the Grammy. It seems a little rude, right? So, and and I think the thing is, is that like when if you can develop healthily mm-hmm. to get to that point. It's empowering, right? And that's where we get confused. It's very empowering if you get to develop healthily or you develop a healthy relationship with your sexuality, with your body, with whatever, right? That's Mm -hmm. empowering. If you don't, that's dangerous. Well, let's talk about this, too. Mm-hmm. Segwaying to this. So they talk about adultification is what, is what happens on the outside. When I was reading a lot more on this topic, they talked about parent, uh, what did I say? parentification, right? Where it happens in the home, whether it's a divorced parent or it's a single mom. Yes, and they're right? usually, it's and they're usually yeah. of the oldest right. black so, female right. child. So, yes, so what it we is, call it is, is, is a parentified child, Yeah, right? Mm-hmm. Parent. Now, parentified child, that happens across the board, right, mm. in a very specific way. But it is it is very, uh, it can be very damaging to the way in which you relate in relationships, mm. right? Because you don't get to be a child, mm. but you're respons- You're emotionally responsible for adults. But you don't have the developmental uh, skills to be that uh, available. Mm-hmm. And so then when you become an adult, which is what I see a lot, um, with my clients is is that then you have a lot of like... And what do you do? Today? Yeah, I was going to say, can we talk about that a bit? Yeah, what do you do? I'm what a do psychotherapist. You do? Hey, y'all. 
<laughs> and not just any psychotherapist. Can we talk a bit about the specifications of your practice? Because mm-hmm. I think it's really fascinating. Yeah, I'm a somatic psychotherapist. So um, I'm, more, I'm more holistic oriented. Mind, body, spirit is my priority. Um, I believe that whatever's happening in your body is happening in your mind. And they're interconnected. And so you can't just focus on one. Right. And that looks very different for different um, clinicians. Right. I'm more I use my body in my practice where there's a lot of somatic therapists who use their use the client's body, whereas I my body informs me on how to work with you. And I address what's happening in your body as well. Um, Now, I, I just as a person who has a lot of respect for holistic practice and. Uh, Western practice. I am seeing this great marriage that's happening lately of even if we're introducing medications, it's a yes and. It's Mm. not just we're medicating and good luck. Well, because people are knowed up now. People are getting knowledgeable. Like it's like they're just like you can give somebody a medication for something. There's also a direct root or a direct a uh, herb or well, a direct it's a synthesized you know like it's it's it's, it's, it's from yeah. a, a root well, everything every you know um greatness happens in balance mm-hmm. right i think in a lot of times we were leaning too western mm-hmm. right like and, an overcorrection yeah and we were just like okay you know it was like it was like all right you know maybe if i you know stick a rock up my ass my hair will stop falling out <laughs> not going to work right <laughs> but <laughs> maybe if i connect back with nature and get all of these chemicals out of my body, my hair will, will grow back, right? right? Like, it's like there's there's a balance. We went all the way left on one end, and then all of a sudden everybody went all the way right, and everybody was like, I'm just going to eat grass forever now. And then people were getting sick, and now we're finding this place where we're coming back to center where it's like you need a good balance of both, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And you need, And that is different for every single person, and the work is finding the balance for you. Well, they they talk about like even in in the adultification process, the a mistrust in healthcare providers. Like yeah. I know a lot of black people that don't go to doctors. Like they just oh. won't do it. Listen, but <laughs> I, I can like, okay. Listen, well, I can attest to that because. I have an autoimmune disease called Hashimoto's. And when I first started experiencing the symptoms of what it was, my hair started falling out. I was having neuropathy in my hands and feet. I was having really um, a hard time standing for long, any any period past like maybe 20 minutes. I, I had to sit down. I had uh, chronic fatigue all of the time. Mm-hmm. And in like a two month period, I put on like 35 pounds and I wasn't doing anything differently. So I cut out wheat, alcohol, sugar. I maybe lost like five pounds, but I still, my feet would swell uncontrollably. And I was going to all of these doctors. I had a food journal. I was writing down my symptoms, what I was doing. I went to seven different doctors before I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's, and three of them prescribed me antidepressants. Three of them suggested that I was lying. One said, well, if you're doing everything that you say you're doing, then, and I was just like, why would I come in with an entire journal that I've been keeping for the last two and a half months saying, this is what I've been eating. This is what I've been finding. This is what I, why would I be saying that to lie to you? But I I realized that, A, because I came in as a woman of color who could speak in complete sentences and had looked up a couple of terms, everyone dismissed me. Hmm. And B, because I had some semblance of I'm not crazy. What's actually happening to me is actually happening. And the reason why I'm alarmed is because I think these things are indicative of a larger problem to come. Mm. Mm -hmm. Nobody would listen to me Mm. until I finally paid out of network $600 to some specialist. And that's the only time that person ever answered my queries, Mm. asked me questions that were relative to me. And that's when we found my diagnosis. But it took seven tries. So I can't even be mad at people of color when they're like, yeah, I don't trust doctors. I wouldn't either. And I had pretty decent insurance and I was paying. It's not like, you know, I was going to. And and I'm not even disparaging people that are going to free clinics. Like those people must have such a hard road. But I was going to this out of network, blah, 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 and paying the money and going online. And I was still trying treated like a damn criminal 
people are saying, this is what's happening with my body and I've looked it up and mm. it seems like it might be these things. May I be tested for them? What are your thoughts? Everybody's like, there's no way you have this. It was so dismissive mm -hmm. and so condescending. And when I started going down the rabbit hole, <clears throat> I started meeting so many women of color, not just in the United States, but in the UK, in Australia, that were having similar experiences about healthcare. This is when I looked up the uh, what adultification means because I think that this is happening to women of color globally, and mm -hmm. I think that it's a call to it's a crisis. Well, it's it's. I'm gonna get on my soapbox real quick because girl, girl is, do it. That's why we got microphones. I actually wrote my grad school thesis on something similar. Um, there's a history. There's a reason. There's a history behind this, right? And not to be that guy, but if we go back to slavery. Um, Hello. If, if you ever have the chance to read Dr. Joy DeGruy's book, um, yes. Introdu My Hero. Oh, and I got to meet her when I graduated. I cried. Oh, my God. I love her so much. I love you so much. Um, <laughs> but in her book, Intergenerational Slave Trauma, she speaks about the, um, the development of gynecology, mm -hmm. which was this piece of shit dude was um, basically uh, abusing black women to figure out our reproductive organs and, and in his writing yeah systemically and, and he was being given carte blanche oh yeah women I yeah, think yeah. That's and healthy, there was no sedative there was out. no medication there was no nothing and what in his writings what he said was is to justify his action is that black women have higher pain tolerances, tolerance but we're more hysterical um i'm not going to go into it but that has been proven um through research that in the medical system that People still believe that, and yes. it is taught. It was taught. It was taught up until recently. Not only is and it taught recently. Okay, my university celebrates him as the father of gynecology. Mm -hmm. So in Yale, I'm gonna put Yale on blast right now. But at the Yale Medical School, this man's photo mm -hmm. is huge. His beginning of surgical tools are on display. The women that he operated on are not described by their name. They're described by subject number and their pictures are in display through this hall. And you have to go there and get and an education that. and see that. Mm. And it's so traumatizing. Absolutely. Mm. And the fact that it's still, it's still, you know, as somebody who also has an autoimmune disease, I have endometriosis. And I had the same experience. It wasn't until I fully leaned into the stereotype and started cussing motherfuckers out. That anybody helped that you people like, started listening to me. To and the crazy this? part about it is that you leaned into a stereotype that was placed because they always give us a reason to be that. <sighs> exactly. They always the give thing. us it's, a it's, reason. It's a snake eating its tail, right? So if we're we're we are seen as hysterical, we're seen as aggressive, we're seen as angry, right? We're seen as having higher pain tolerance. And so when you show up, right and so ima imagine that as a child. As I, I was diagnosed, I was very lucky. Uh, my gynecologist was my mother's doctor. Um, and so she listened to me. But when I went to other doctors, I was 14 when I got diagnosed with endometriosis. They prescribed me with Oxycontin. Oh, mm. my God. And Percocets what? at 14. Could you imagine if my parents didn't have were the Were your doctors my... white or black? White. Okay. And I think white. that I just, I mean, I don't know about you. But this just makes me cry, and I feel like it's almost an ancestral pain. Like I'm yeah. crying for all of the women. Like, I, because I remember going when I was in college, seeing that whenever as I had a job at the med school, mm -hmm. and I would have to go through this particular hall to deliver um, reports for the person I was working for, and I just remember seeing that every day, and I remember reading a study about it, and they were like, well, there's, in the last blah, blah, blah years, and they pointed to people like Cornel West and Henry Louis Gates and uh, Kathy Cohen, who, po who pointed out, like, how racist this was and whatever, and there's still this belief that it was still a justified means yeah. to an end. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, how do we even talk about an adultification bias when you still believe that this is a justified means to an end? And I'd even be willing to accept that well, if there was an apology or an acknowledgement of well, there's we not going to be an apology because people. they would have to acknowledge what they did, and in they'd order have to, to acknowledge those in people order, as and in, people. And in, if they acknowledge it, that means they have to te technically rewrite history and rewrite the actual truth because and they're not going to do that. I'm well, telling you, they have like, I mean, if, if I'm wrong, 
I think they they did a study on like something like 130 something women. I don't remember. And the library, right? Because mm-hmm. you have to go past this hall where mm-hmm. they had, and I don't know if it's on display at the Yale um, Medical School anymore. Oh, he did. So, yes. On, oh, I, 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 I call bullshit. He probably did it on on hundreds and hundreds of women. Okay. Those but are the even, women he recorded. Yes, but even those women, there are pictures of them. Oh, yeah. And there's no record of their names. Of course. Anywhere. So it would say subject 37. Yeah, some one of the most distended famous. Distended uterus and then list. So, But they would have this woman's picture. And you know that she showed up in the best outfit that she had. Hoping that this man was going to help her because many of the things that he was studying is at the time when women would become pregnant, they would become incontinent because of the medical procedure that was done at the time. So a lot of these women came in because they could no longer work because they were now incontinent. Mm -hmm. And these women were coming in for their help. And rather than saying this woman's name is Sadie or whatever, subject 37. And Mm -hmm. I would almost say that the women who came in well dressed were the ones who probably got treated the best because he was he was doing tests on his on slaves. Yeah. One of the most famous picture. And I I, it's burned into my mind. I can if I could draw, I could draw it for you. And it's a it's a woman. She has a a rapa on her head. She has like a dark skirt with like a little bit of a um, like a like an apron. And she's sitting on her knees on top of the table and it's just these white men around that shit is burned into my mind subject 52 mm. and wow. I I, rem- I remember I was doing research on endometriosis because I wasn't getting any help I was suffering I was whatever and that's when I went down the rabbit hole and I saw that I remember I was sick to my stomach and that image is burnt it's obviously burned into my mind. Now, um, mind you, they have these images. Okay, so you're talking about adultification in younger children. You're in college. What are you, like 18, 17? Mm-hmm. And the fact that they would even have something like that displayed is still like you're not even. <laughs> and, I just and, read, but there was so much of that well, in college. Every, But at every college. Yeah. Well, you're still, I, 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 have, I consider myself still a child in college. And, and like, listen, <laughs> 95% of the time, let's be clear, we are the only ones who know the story. Yes. Mm-hmm. So they don't know. So when else? we're walking by crying or angry, face red, nauseous, and people are like, what's wrong with you? And you're like, get the fuck out of my face. They don't know why you have an attitude. They don't realize that you're watching somebody who tortured people who look like you being glorified. They don't even know that history. Because they looked at you as a lab rat. Right. And they still do. And so when when you you have any idea or you've had any wherewithal behind your own medical history, you're almost treated worse. Because how dare you speak up? How dare you think Mm -hmm. that you could look in an encyclopedia or in Wikipedia or WebMD at your symptoms and say, these are the seven symptoms I have. Right. I've looked and the research points to these five things. How dare you? How well, dare you I mean, think you know more than me? Well, here's the thing. Now we have to circle back to like, you know, the you know the school systems and the Ugh. educational systems, right? So like I remember I remember there was uh, you know, you know, have the town hall, you know, you're in a suburb, we're in a township, and they were going back and forth about whether they should get uniforms, right? And the reason why they was getting uniforms is because it was a lot of black children, black girls specifically, being sent home because their skirt was a we're little bit short. shorter or whatever the case may be. So all the black parents were like, let's back it. let's get uniforms do you know most of the white parents uh the most of the white parents they voted against it they was like well that's going to take care that's going to um uh, what, do you, what do you call it? That's going to get rid of our children's um, individual ind- individual um, individuality, individuality and stuff like that. And whole time it's like, well, we're trying to rectify a situation that does not pertain to you because your daughter, Miss Molly, is over here pretty much taught ties pointed, crop and showing, trying to doing and the because, same stuff that we're doing and doing the same thing. But it's watching like the, the same rap city right, that we're same doing thing. and the development of, like you said, about the black body is just you know just how we are developing how genetics are. It, it was looked at like why why is why is this girl ups- um is it acceptable for her to wear this and her not wear this let's just rectify the whole situation put everybody in uniforms and mm. no yeah of course not because they don't recognize the experience I have a I have a quick story mm-hmm. of it's it's not it wasn't about my body but I was a bit of a problem child in school 
I was a little rowdy. You? Yeah, how, just a little bit. I mean, you're uh, still rowdy now. <laughs> you're still right. You're still right. You're still I, rowdy in the ditch. <laughs> I am. Um, I don't have a math brain at all. And my father is a, an engineer, mathematician, like full math brain. And I was failing math constantly. And I was in middle school. And mommy, forgive me for telling this story. Um, and I, <laughs> I got an A on my math test. And I was fucking stoked. You understand me? I was in class just happy, just like, woo, 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 woo. Just Did happy. That. Got the A. My, the, the little white boy sitting next to me gave me some Skittles. I ate some Skittles. Rowdy, excited. Having a, the best day of my life. You understand me? I'm about to make my father <laughs> proud. Like, I was in it. I went home. I was taking a luxurious bubble bath. Mother, I'm, mommy, forgive me. My mother came in there and whooped my ass in the bathtub. I didn't even know what I was getting whooped for. I was getting fucked up. And all of a sudden she goes, how dare you get drunk in school? My excitement translated to my teacher oh, that I was drunk. No. I was, I, I'm getting emotional thinking about it. I actually confronted him and he profusely apologized. As an adult, I confronted him. But I got the whooping of my life. I didn't even know what I was getting whooped for. You know, and that's Because the thing. I was excited. We. For getting an A. But. They thought you, I was drunk. But here's the thing. That's crazy. But here's the thing. Some experience like that happened to your mom in a different way. Absolutely. And it was much more punitive to her. Absolutely. So in her mind, what she was doing was protecting Absolutely. you. Absolutely. She was What she was horrified. doing was conditioning you. Mm -hmm. And I'm so thankful for my mother mm -hmm. because my mother had that experience and did not pass it on mm. to me and yeah. worked very tirelessly mm -hmm. because I'll tell you a story, right? Mm -hmm. So I was in the eighth grade and I went to the same school from seventh to 12th grade. I went to a very ritzy private school where rich people send their children mm -hmm. and movie stars send their children. So I was waiting to be picked up after school mm -hmm. And the kids around me, all white, got a photo cleaner and they were huffing it. Mm. And their responses were hilarious. So I'm sitting there laughing and they're like, do you want to huff that? And I'm like, hell no. I don't know what the hell that is. Mm -hmm. Right. Because she be black mm -hmm. and we don't know about huff. That's not anything. That's not that we, we do. Know. We're not doing that. We know cognac, Hennessy, weed. We know the classic. <laughs> That's, That's not it. it. We ain't That's it. it. That's not, That's we, it. not it. <laughs> so, but I'm sitting there being, you know, thoroughly entertained while eating my Starburst, whatever. Mm -hmm. The security guard comes up, rounds us all up, mm -hmm. calls our parents, calls my mother and everybody's parents. And they're like, and, and, and. My mother says, okay, first of all, you owe me um, the cab fare that I spent to get here. Period. You owe me retroactive um, tuition, and you owe my daughter an apology. Did you look at all of these children, and then did you look at my child? Did you see how all of these children have red eyes and goofy expressions while my daughter does not? Yet she mm. lumped her into this experience when she is not in the photo class, does not have access to $89 photo cleaner, but you lumped her into this experience, apologized expeditiously. Maya, Love are it. you okay? And Love I was like, it. yeah. I mean, but I'm sitting there like You're 14 yeah. being like, yeah, I'm okay. And she's like, it's okay. We'll have a discussion about it at home. You did a great job and it was wonderful oh, that you kept your composure. But I'm lucky that I had that mother and who saw through the bullshit because the bullshit had happened mm -hmm. to her. And my mother, I, this is the reason why I wanted to carry this episode across the network. Mm -hmm. Adultification is something that, because black women have been experiencing it for generations, we're passing it on to our Absolutely. children. Absolutely. And it's got to stop with you know Well, I got a story. I'll me, tell you guys a story. Oh, okay, go ahead, I, go, ahead, go, ahead, go ahead. I just want to follow up because that is a beautiful ending. Mm -hmm. And in my situation, because for the mothers out there that did jump in the bathroom and whoop their daughter's asses, I'm going to tell you this. What my mother did do that I will always honor her for is that after she got out of her own trigger and whooped my ass, she listened to me. She absolutely listened to me and she believed me. Mm -hmm. And, and she when corrected. I tell you, she corrected, she apologized. Mm -hmm. And when I tell you she walked up into Murray Hill Middle School and shut that <laughs> motherfucker down, 
because that's they the never called her had. again. They we never called her again. No. Even when they <laughs> were triggered by their own responses, they corrected they and, correct. they, and they protected. My mom was the same way. And that's mm-hmm. important. It my mom is. was the same because way. We had a um, tell your story. No, mm-hmm. we had a uh, so we had like a festival. Um, in our town, the African American Day Festival, you know that you get like the little gag gifts, like yeah, the silly yeah, string yeah, and yeah, stuff like that. <laughs> and so I picked up a fart spray because it's just funny, right? I took it to school one day and I sprayed a little under this thing and it came up. And of course, all the kids like, "Hey, what's her? Hey, what's her?" You rat ass ass kids, but they ratted on me. It's fine. <laughs> so we go down to the office <laughs> and they call my mom and they're like, um, uh, "They call my mom." My mom came down. She's like, "Yeah, she was disruptive in class." And she looked at the records and it was like, "Oh, they, they tried to put on my record that I had contract." band at school no and my mom said absolutely not i said you're not gonna tell my child my black child that she had contraband this is fart spray all she did if you want to in school suspend her because she was disrupting class that's one thing to put on her record she has contraband and when you look at contraband they are dangerous materials they are guns, weapons, weapons. they're guns you're not gonna Knives. put that no, on her no. over fart mm-hmm. spray so my mom was the same way she and was why like, would absolutely. you do that to a child because they don't care. This, but this is it. They don't. And see it's like, children. why are? And that's what I realized, especially after the shooting of what was that child, Ralph? Uh, uh, I can't remember his last name. I apologize. But I saw. I was like, oh, this is reiterated to me over and over and over again, generation after generation after generation, that they don't see us as children. Yeah. And I told the story the last time, mm-hmm. but I remember when we moved from Ralph Yarl. Ralph Yarl. Mm-hmm. I was like, I was like, Yard, that ain't right. See, I knew to trust my mind. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm glad that I believed in myself. Mm-hmm. Um, but I knew that they didn't see him. What was he? Fifteen or sixteen? At the fourteen. Time? Fourteen. Fourteen. Okay. What they saw was a twenty-year-old. They saw and men. This is and this is the problem. And I remember when we moved from the USC area, which was around like thirty. Sixth and Figueroa and like Expedition around there to Hancock Park. My mother had me make cookies and brownies and we took them to the fire department and to the police department. And I realized that my mother was getting these people to see me as a child Mm -hmm. and not just a random black kid. Mm -hmm. And I realized that my mother was doing that to protect me. But I didn't realize that until, I don't know, two decades later. I was like, oh, my mom's a G. Mm-hmm. Right, because it's important. Let's let, let us let our kids be kids, and it's but and the it's, things that we have to do mm-hmm. to yeah. tell our kids or trick people into seeing our kids as, as kids. kids is wild to me. Well, they're also doing a lot of things to make us not be kids. Like you go back to like um, we we're talking about being uh, more mature in the household, right? Then you have to go back to them taking our black men to jail over something as silly as weed and separating families and disbarring families. They've been literally detaching our black men from our families since the test of time. So now you got your mom and you have the oldest child and they need help. They're looking at their youngest son to be the man of the house. Now he has all this pressure to be the man of the house. And so when he wants to be a child and he can't that forms you know resentment because he can't go and play be on the soccer team Absolutely. on a Saturday morning yeah. because he has to be at home so it's a lot more it's a it's yeah a, it's a systemic thing that has so many tentacles mm-hmm. and I think especially I don't maybe I'm I feel like especially in this year I'm in my 40s I have a lot of friends I have three friends in the last 48 hours that have died under the age of 50, Mm. black men, Mm. giants in my industry. Mm. And were successful by all accounts. One died of colon cancer. I don't know what Aaron died of, but you know, Aaron Spears was a juggernaut and an amazing human. And at 47 years old, he's Mm. gone. Uh, You know, James Casey, uh, there's so many Eric Parker, I'm seeing so many black men not make it to 50. And I think this adultification bias has something to do with it. Absolutely. Because there's a stress that's happening, an underlying health the current. The stress. Well, listen. It's the and stress. I think, and I, and it's, it's been weighing on my heart because I'm even seeing in my own community, look at all the black rappers that we've lost under the age of 55 in the last five years. Mm-hmm. It's an extensive list. Mm-hmm. I think something's wrong. Mm-hmm. Well, listen, if you don't allow a child to be a child, you disrupt their development. And, neuro- and neurological pathways. Absolutely. 
Oh, you that's decision making, that's stress management, that's love, how to love, mm. how to care, how to nurture, how to be nurtured, how to take in love. You're disrupting the entire way that we are supposed to develop when you do that. So then you're you're trying you're you're consistently trying to catch up. Think about running a race where you're constantly trying to catch up with everybody else. You're taxing your fucking body. You're taxing your mind, you're taxing your heart, you're taxing your spirit. So the amount of mental health, the amount of self-care, the amount of work we have to do on ourselves is double triple everybody else. Mhm. Because we didn't even get to develop properly. Right. And we keep pointing and saying, hey, we're having an issue. I feel like, especially, I'm just gonna say this, and y'all can feel however you wanna feel and however you are out there, but I feel like black people especially are the only group that have never gotten the opportunity to properly address their trauma. Period. And properly get the remedies that we would need to move forward. And the minute we keep saying, hey, we need help, we're the only group that you're like, we'll help you, but the conditions are so hefty. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, after all this time, what's the point? <laughs> Why do you need to do that? Right, it's like, I mean, yeah, and you know, they they're keep telling us, oh, well, that happened so long ago. It really hasn't been that long ago. You're trying to make us believe it's been that long ago, but it hasn't. But you're I, also talking like, about what is that long ago? What, what is, is that, that long ago when we're is still there a seeing people that right. look like us being shot on a monthly basis? Right. And we've been seeing that for the last, Wait, you know, 70 some odd years. Not even that. I have a friend whose grandmother, her grandmother was a slave. Mm-hmm. So she has reco- like she has the recollection of a person who was alive and was a slave when she was a child. Mm-hmm. There are people here who have talked to people who were slaves. My great grandmother's father was a slave. But even talking about like we know about the, the it's even like we go to okay. So in my on my father's side, the white people that owned us as slaves still own a great deal of the town. And they have the last name that I have, and they look like us. They just look like the white county, but they have the same shape. They have the same nose. They have the same butt. They have the same facial features. And you're like, these people are clearly related to me. Mm -hmm. Not just in ownership because of name, but I can see the ancestral rape Mm -hmm. from this person who owns the barbecue chain Mm-hmm. in the town so I'm like this isn't that far away and I'm like I'm not even why can't we acknowledge that every country has some bad beginnings and some weird history it doesn't negate the country itself it's just mm-hmm. a part of the tapestry yeah. of the country but when you choose to say that the telling of my truth makes you feel bad because that's what the whole we're barring critical race theory is about right, you're saying that to my truth the, the makes history. you feel terrible so I don't get to say it out loud and I'm just like okay well then where do we stand where do we go so let's put this in some positives because we don't want it just mm-hmm. to be this pity session you are making strides in the community through a holistic and psychotherapeutic approach. Yes. What are the aims? What do you see as the possible solutions for people just to even begin? If any of my clients see this, they're gonna know exactly what I'm about to say. Right? They're gonna know exactly <laughs> what I'm about to say. And it does, I'm not fully answering your question, but I want to say this is play. Play, 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 play. That's a wonderful response. Play. That's wonderful. Mm. Play with your friends. Play with your lovers. Play with your parents. Play with your siblings. You didn't get to play, so play. My main focus in my practice is quality of life and the importance of play because we don't get to play. We don't. There's this um, on Instagram. We don't. There's this thing, and I love to follow it. It's called Black Men Who Frolic. Love that. <laughs> that was one of my favorites. It's so good. It's and beautiful. I was just like, this is so 
beautiful and well, it makes me so happy. It makes me so sorry. I also, I also saw another thing. It was just like, hang out with girlfriends that tap into your inner child. And I said, and that's real. I love because that. Because some of my best friends are the ones I can take a nap with yeah. and just be goofy, goofy with. Goofy and silly. And, you know, and I can walk around without my bonnet and, and just do fuck. weird shit. And it really, it, it's very soothing for the soul because we do go out here with a battle of armor on us all the time. All like, the time. It's even like, even like, I was even say for me as a personal experience like the shit that I go through and the fact that I don't necessarily always can allow myself to ask for help like I don't remember the last time I truly cried like mm. to be honest like and I'm not talking about like you know like a little tear up here like mm. actually cried like I felt like when I, even I was packing up my apartment and just going through all the memories that I mm. had you know into this new transition I was like I was waiting for a moment that I like oh, I would want to break down wait till you get to your 40s you're gonna cry like all the I time. just I did <laughs> but I felt like I felt like there I do feel like there is a part of me that knows that like like subconsciously what has been taught to me especially as a strong black woman is that we don't cry is that Mm -hmm. not necessarily that we don't cry is that if you cry you'll be weak and if you Mm -hmm. are weak you won't be able to move forward so I think that I won't survive Mm -hmm. so just like I'm waiting for a moment in my life where I don't have to work on survival mode and that has mm-hmm. been and then going like skipping that development process mm-hmm. of like this I, I you know we skip too fast like mm-hmm. my mom was a single mom like we pretty much we did we, we t- my mom took care of us but she's working my grandmother was working so mm-hmm. we pretty much developed our own like and luckily we weren't bad kids like right mentality. luckily we weren't bad kids we were we were good kids yeah. we weren't on the street we but we didn't have right. the option to be bad kids right but i was working at 15 yeah. and, and and we could say that in the crazy part like before before you start <laughs> me and my friends we we say that with the pride thing like oh I've been working since I was 15 mm. but as I'm older why the hell was I working at 15 Period. like wh- you know what I mean like why did I feel the, ne- the, the necessity I to make ta- sure I go to the workforce at 15 mm. but 15 I will tell is you nothing. my mom I, and again I think again we pass on and this is one mm-hmm. of the reasons why I'm so glad we're having these conversations mm-hmm. because I really think that our parents try as they might mm-hmm. right I, we need to give them more credit than we are Absolutely. because they Absolutely. were really trying to break some generational trauma traumas that Absolutely. were like the weight of Gibraltar. Right, right. Because I mean? okay. like, I mean, we got our own problems, but they had no, another right. set of problems. Yeah. I remember, <laughs> to your point, right? I remember one time I was left outside of a theater and um, transportation wouldn't get me. Mm-hmm. And so my mom had to come, but it was like a 40 minute drive. Mm. And it was like midnight in mm-hmm. downtown. And I was upset because I got left and nobody checked. And I was upset because I'm the only black girl. I was the only Mm -hmm. black performer, period. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I'm the one that's left on the steps of what's now. No one What they call the Staples Center. It's got a new name. What's it now? Uh, Crypto. Thank you. Them. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting there, you know, waiting outside. And I'm calling my mom. And I'm, you know, saying, you know, I can't believe they left me. (laughs) My mom goes, stop crying immediately. You'll be vulnerable. And people might, Mm -hmm. you know, you're you're a target. Mm -hmm. Don't cry. Mm -hmm. And I know that my mother was doing that out of protection. Protection. Because Mm -hmm. that is what was necessary in that moment. But I also give her so much grace Mm -hmm. because what else was she supposed to give me? Right. Because she already knew, she Mm -hmm. already knew what it would look like. And and it's it's, it's a, it's a, it's a double edged sword because in knowing what you sitting there crying and being vulnerable would do to you, even though she may have not wanted to give you that response, she knew she had had to to because of the way the world is working. And that's what I mean. Mm -hmm. I feel like we owe our parents the recognition Mm. of the grace that was involved in those decisions and how Absolutely. hard that must have been. Absolutely. And I think that in our stopping these generational traumas, mm-hmm. we also have to acknowledge what our parents went through mm-hmm. to put us even in a different headspace where we could. Absolutely. Right. What were we going to say to Actually, Dutch? I have three things I'm going to say. Okay. Right. To that, this is what I tell people all the time. When you look at the things that your parents have done to you that you look at as like the way in which they've traumatized you, remember that they have healed 
significantly more than what they've put on you. Mm -hmm. And that when you can look at your parents and see them as a human, as a person, and you can acknowledge, damn, as much shit as I have, as much trauma as I have, that means there's so much more that they healed before they even got to me. And that I'm going to heal a significant amount of that before it gets to my kids, but some of it is going to seep through to them. There's a grace that you can offer them and a love that you can have for them. Mm -hmm. The second thing I want to say is to what you said when you were saying you're waiting for a moment. Mm -hmm. Stop waiting for the moment. Mm -hmm. Choose to have it Mm -hmm. because you'll wait forever Mm -hmm. because your defenses are, are, are brilliant. They, the, your defenses are set up in a way to keep you safe and they will keep you safe until they know they don't have to keep you safe from that. Mm-hmm. So instead of waiting for a moment to feel that, choose to have it. And set set it up, not only choose to have it, but set it up for yourself and whatever it looks like for yourself. But I yeah. don't know. And but that's the thing. I and think it's that, that you have like to, a, but here's mm-hmm. where the giving yourself to per, the permission mm-hmm. to play comes in mm-hmm. into practice mm-hmm. because play because with it. play with it it's an unknown so you get that but that i know we are conditioned to see unknowns as really scary things mm-hmm. but in this case an unknown with a permission to play means multiple tries to get it right like a sandbox mm-hmm. that you didn't get to play in mm-hmm. right multiple times mm-hmm. to find the tools mm-hmm. and i'll tell you okay this is a perfect example. So I just started working for a new artist. I, I work as a singer. So I just started working for a new artist. And like you said, my counterpart is my sis. And I trust her. And so all day, we just make stupid jokes. Mm-hmm. We make stupid and we laugh all the time. And so for this run, we were in Vegas doing a residency I always have an agenda of 19 things that I'm supposed to do because now I have free time. And for the first time in my damn life, I just went to sleep. I love and that. for the first four days, I felt really guilty about just going to sleep. And I was like, maybe this is my body saying, maybe you just need to sleep mm-hmm. because I never woke up feeling like, oh, I slept too much. I was like, oh, you and I realized the reason why I was sleeping so much was because for the first time in a long time on a job, I didn't feel like I needed to fight anybody. Mm. I didn't feel like I needed to fight for my space or fight for my voice or fight to be heard or fight for the money or fight for any of it. Mm-hmm. And this was the first time in working in 20 plus years where I felt like I don't really have any battle here. Mm. Things are nice. My coworkers are nice. My space is nice. I've been given what I need. It's taken me 25 freaking years to get here. That's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> but for the first time in a long time, I felt, felt like I could just go to sleep. And there was nothing pressing and the world wasn't going to end. And if people called, you know what? They'll call back. Mm. And I think, you know, for the last thing that I wanted to say that kind of leads into that, when we're trying to figure out how to heal that part of us, how to heal the adultified child in us, right? And you'll hear therapists say this kind of shit all the time, right? And half the time when they say I'll be like, all right, yeah, we know this, we know this. But I truly believe this when it comes to us. I truly mm. believe us as black folks, one of the biggest things one of the things that will offer us the most healing is to heal our child self, Mm -hmm. is to go in and look at our child self and see all the moments we didn't get to play, we didn't get to explore, we didn't get to rest, Mm -hmm. we didn't get to do the things that children do. Children get to rest, we did it. Children get naps. Children get to explore what feels good, what they need, how to self-regulate. Children aren't jockeying for money at 15. Right. Right, children get to figure out wh- how to cry, when to cry, mm-hmm. when it feels good, when it doesn't. Children get to do that. And we, we're having this conversation because we want right. the next generation of black children to do that. To and get so, to be ch- children. 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 Well, I think, go ahead. I was just going to say, last little. No, go ahead. Is you if you want to figure out where to start, 
start with your child self and go talk to your child self and see where the wounds lie and start there. And start see where with those the happiness wounds. lies. Absolutely. See where oh, the times where you're happy. Absolutely. Because the happiness is what we're trying to craft in our adulthood. Mm -hmm. If we don't go back to the times where we know we were truly happy, mm -hmm. how can we shape it in adulthood. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I just want to say, guys, um, all you guys out there, I hope you guys enjoyed this conversation on the adultification mm -hmm. bias of black children. Um, you know, we have Maya and we have Nadej. And y'all know <laughs> I'd like to leave some type of message at the end of my shows um, just because I feel like you have to put out in the world what you want to receive. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, Maya, Nadej, would you like to leave a message about I would I would, okay so I would, I want to I want to specify this things that you think can rectify the adultification of children what would you give a tip for Me personally I think that I tried to open this box if you will because I wanted us to start having conversations and adultification bias is not a monolith we all have our tailored experiences with this issue. So my hope for this series and what it's brought to the public and what it's brought to black children now and black people who once were children is talk about it. Mm -hmm. Just talk about it. Start by just talking about it. It doesn't have to be solved today. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be solved. Maybe it's not a solvable thing, but I think with awareness, will change it because with awareness, people will have more of a wherewithal of what to do. Mm -hmm. So just start talking. For me, I would say play, like the real kind of play. Like play with your friends, play with your lovers, play with your family, play with your siblings, play with everybody and talk to and love and hug and nurture and kiss your child self every second that you can. Find your child self and love them the way that they didn't get to be loved and treat them like the child that they are and play, 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 play. Also, we want to hear from you at Slap the Power. What are the experiences with adultification bias that you've had? What are the remedies that you found that worked for you? Here at this network, we are a community mm -hmm. and we will solve our issues by talking about them honestly and by sharing the solutions that work. So we want to hear from you. Truly. Absolutely. And absolutely. thank you. Thank you for having this yes. platform. Yes, for us. absolutely. Absolutely. Like you said, we are a family and it's very important that we do have these discussions. So if you heard anything or you have any more questions, you have any more comments, you can reach Maya at Slap the Power. You can reach Nadege as well. All of her information will be posted here. Please like, subscribe, share, and join in. And that's it. That's, that's all. all. That's It, That's All is written by me, Casey Carnage, and produced by myself and Rick Barrio Dill. Associate producer, Brie Corey. Assistant producer, Larissa Donahoe. Audio and video engineering and studio facilities provided by Slap Studios LA with distribution through our collective for social progress and cultural expression, Slap the Network. If you have any ideas for a show you want to hear or see, please email us at info at slapthepower.com. And as always, go to dazzitdassall.com and sign up there to make sure you will never miss a thing. See you next show.